another episode of High Low Sports. I'm Kelsey, joined today by DJ, and we are going to finish out our recap of the NFL's top 100 list. Uh, so huge snubs. And DJ, what do you think about some of these snubs? First of all, last time I was a real adamant component of get Darius Leonard on there. He's in the 20s. I think that was a really good spot for him. So thank you if I know it was already voted on. But I'm going to take credit for that. 26 for the rookie should have been in the Pro Bowl. So that was a great job. But on the other hand, how... How do you leave off three of the best players in the world we're looking at? Casey Hayward, top five, top ten corner. Chris Harris, pretty much the exact same thing. Top five, top ten corner, depending on how you look at it. And Quentin Nelson, the best guard in football, not named Zach Martin. Neither one, None of those guys make the top 100? I mean, you got some guys on here that have no business being in there by comparison. I mean, I just look at the bottom of the list. Mitchell Schwartz, Schwartz, really good tackle. Not as good as Quinn Nelson, not as good as Chris Harris. Eric Weddle, love me some Eric Weddle, but you're taking Chris Harris and them off. And even on the thing, none of those guys were 101. 101 was Richard Sherman, basically, if they went that far from what the numbers say. So I think you left three of the best players in the world off of this list, and there's plenty of guys you could take off to replace them, in my humble opinion. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we also talk about guys like we, we talked about in the last episode where we started in the top, you know, the initial 50, Le'Veon Bell, whether he is included or not. Well, he's not included again, so you know maybe throwing him in there as well. But that one, I could definitely understand them not putting him in. But yeah, you're right. Casey Hayward, one of the best corners in the league, top three. The other one being Chris Harris as an as your one B maybe in corners. Like, I understand why you don't put them too high because they don't get a lot of picks. They mostly do pass breakups, like especially Hayward. Like it was kind of the joke Richard Sherman made about Revis get your picks up, bro. Case Hayward gets a lot of pass breakups, but not as many picks. But still, he's a top 100 player. He's a top six-ish corner, depending on what you like. Yeah. And it's funny because you talk about his picks, but it's hard to get picks when you don't throw it, throw at the guy. Like, I mean, he's so such a, so so effective, you just don't throw throw at him. Exactly, exactly. It's like, if you look, I bet you look at the ratios of passes he's defended versus his number of picks. He's probably on par with some of the pick leaders. Uh, but, you know, just based off of ratios, but... Yeah, they just don't throw at him. Same with Chris Harris. They just don't throw at him. They threw at Aqib Tlaib instead of him. Like, Well, Aqib was, Tlaib was in L.A., but I know what you're getting. Well, yeah, you, yeah. But, you know, the opposite corner from these guys is who they're always throwing at. And then Quentin Nelson. I mean, talk about a monster of a guard. If you're teaching young kids how to be a offensive guard and especially a blindside guard, I'm sorry. I don't know if there's a better guy to, to model, especially a young guy, to model these young kids after. I mean, he's the ultimate mauler in the run game. He's... I don't know what else what he has to do to get on the list. I mean, he was Offensive Rookie of the Month in one of these months, I mean, as a guard. I mean, I understand a lot. not a lot of offensive linemen make this list, maybe like the best five or seven or so in the world, but come on. You have Zach Martin, understandably so. Tyron Smith, understandably so. David Bakhtiari, I believe, was on here, understandably so. Mitchell Schwartz, Schwartz, really good, not Quinton Nelson, I mean. Andrew Whitworth, okay, I mean, probably one of the better tackles, makes sense. Just going through the list. Trent Williams, fantastic tackle, but over Quentin Nelson, debatable. Yeah. Like Taylor Luan, fantastic tackle. He Basically, the reason the Titans can run the ball so well it starts with him and ends with him and Derrick Henry. But at the same time, Quentin Nelson, the second best to first best guard in football. Jason Kelsey's on the list. Makes sense. Yeah. Just going through these offensive linemen. Like, I pretty much named almost all of them. Zach Martin, Tyron Smith, David Bakhtiari. Yep, I've already... I think I went through all of them already. So how Quinn Nelson's not among those guys is just amazing to me. Exactly. And, you know, I, I know offensive linemen that looked at his big bruisers. But come on, guys. Like, you can't tell me that somebody like Khalil Mack and Vaughn Miller can make this list, but the guys that completely stub them stub them in a game, like, they don't make the list? Like, I'm sorry, what? The perfect That's... example is Jadavian Clowney. He made it, and he was in the top 50. I can't remember his exact number, but he was pretty high up there. Did anyone else see what Quentin Nelson did to that man, especially in those last two games? He completely mauled him. And Javon Clowney kind of gets a little bit of, I don't want to say slack, but being that number one overall pick, and he was 63, by the way. But he gets a little bit of slack because he's a freak of nature, but he doesn't average 50 sacks a season. But he's still one of the best defenders in the NFL, I mean, especially against the run. Yeah, and I mean, just just between that or when Javon and J.J. would split, switch sides, he still would handle J.J. when he do the stunt. Which, by the way, I don't know if there's a better defensive ta- or defensive end at doing a, a running stunt moves than J.J. Watt, but yeah. you know that's another conversation for another day. But you know, Quentin Nelson's able to stop that, stop that, stop that as well. I mean, you have a guy that I, I I'm building a team, and I have my choice in guards, as we saw from our Madden draft the other night. 
I literally will take Quentin Nelson over a whole lot of guys, including, I'm sorry, Zach Martin, but including mm-hmm. you as well. Like, I'm taking Q over you. And it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, if I'm building an offense, that's who I want as my, my blindside guard. Hell, you could probably play tackle or center, whatever you need, so I'm surprised he didn't make it in there. But we'll go back to the guys that are on the list just to wrap this up since it's a, it's ended for a few days now. Yep. The top ten was kind of intriguing. I mean, leading up to it, I was like, we kind of thought we had knew it was going to go there. I know we mentioned the 499s. Bobby didn't make it. DeAndre Hopkins didn't make it. Like, how DeAndre we Hopkins? <laughs> how DeAndre Hopkins is not in the top ten is blasphemous, unacceptable, religiously terrible. Like, yeah, no. what? Yeah, th- I mean, come on, your best receiver by far, and he's still getting better. Like, he's not A.B. where A.B. disappeared. Um, yeah, I mean, stats-wise, it looks okay. But if you tell me you watched Stiller's games last year and you thought he was the best Stiller on the field, I'm going to punch you in the face. Like, there's there's no way that is true. I'm sorry. He's not even the best player on his own team. He shouldn't be. He shouldn't have been ranked that high. I, like, DeAndre was a, far and above better than any other receiver last year. So when we look at this top ten, there. We're just going to go through it really quick for anyone who hasn't seen it. Von Miller was 10, Julio Jones was 9, Aaron Rodgers was 8, Antonio Brown 7, Tom Brady 6, Todd Gurley 5, Patrick Mahomes 4, Khalil Mack 3, Drew Brees 2, Aaron Donald 1. We would mentioned AB. I think he's still a top 20 guy. I think him and DeAndre, you could swap and be just fine. Like, have him at 11, DeAndre in that 6th spot, 6th, 7th spot. That's fine. I mean, we're not saying that AB's not a top 3 receiver in the game. No. Maybe even top 4, depending on what you think of Michael Thomas. Suit. But... And Julio Jones, he can be in the top 10. I mean, I still didn't think DeAndre is the best receiver in the game. You want to say Julio, you want to split them 1A, 1B. To each their own, but DeAndre, 11, just feels wrong. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned Bobby as well. Uh, you just said the top 10. I, I look at that, and I see Aaron Rodgers in there. And after his – don't get me wrong. <laughs> what he did on one leg last year, impressive. One leg in quotes. He did whenever things when he was running, he looked just fine. As when things went bad, he started. I think his leg wasn't as badly injured as it was thought. It, well, it's possible, but going off of reports, we'll just go off of reports. <laughs> he did this all on one leg, and that's impressive. But by no means was his season top ten in the NFL worthy. He led the NFL in throwing the ball out of bounds. Is either oh, Devonta Adams isn't wide open, spike out of bounds, and don't like it. It exactly. was a, he's a good quarterback. He was really good. He was a top twenty ish type player. But you look at the quarterbacks. He's ranked above in the top ten. We scroll down. Had a Philip Rivers, Pro Bowl guy. Andrew Luck, probably second in the NFL in touchdowns. Pro Bowl snub at first, still made it in there. Jared Goff, Russell Wilson, like all those guys have a reasonable case to be ahead of him. Exactly, and you know, that he. I don't know. Maybe it's favoritism in the NFL voters, but I just I don't see Bobby Wagner being worse than Aaron Rodgers. Maybe it's because Bobby Wagner isn't that talkative of a guy. Maybe it's because he is the prototypical like I'm going to lead my team through my example, not based off of my vo- voice. And you know, I imagine he is a vocal guy in the locker room, but as far as in front of the media, he says all the right things, just like the other face of the franchise in Seattle. I mean. You say all the right things, but his actually seems like he means it, whereas with Russell, you kind of like, ah, I question this. Say one thing, hear another thing. That's yeah, right. exactly. So, But I just don't see I don't see Bobby Wagner being worse than an Aaron Rodgers last season and even going forward. I know he's getting older, but he's still He's the best middle linebacker in guy. football. Even if you want to say Luke Heakley, Bobby is not far behind. If anything else, you want to split hairs, Bobby plays every game. Luke, unfortunately, has had some head injuries. So, I mean, exactly, you're looking right. at 299 overall, quote-unquote, caliber players. He's got to be – if you're not going to put him in top 10, put him in, like, the 11, 12, 13 spot. You, having him at 15 seems entirely too low. Yeah, he sucked a smack in the face. I, I Don't get me wrong. I know this, the Seahawks didn't have a great season last year, but – They were a playoff team. They were a playoff team. A, very good defense. That defense yeah. and a running game carry that team. Exactly. I, I, so it's and then Russell Wilson sitting way too back in the pocket for way too long. That's what gets that team in the playoffs. But you don't get to that playoff without a guy, a stalwart on defense that you lose the entire Legion of Boom. And if including and, Earl Thomas early in the season. Yeah, and then you have to replace them, and and you you can't really replace the Legion of Boom from what it was. But you can just kind of put guys there. Bobby Wagner kept them together kept the attitude up, kept the morale up, and led that led that defense to a playoff berth. Like, and he just murked everybody. He was one of the best at tackling and stripping it. He's fantastic. That's just a snub. And a, that's a snub if I've ever seen one. 
And honestly, how is Patrick Mahomes not number one? I mean, especially because you're saying the top 100 players of 2019. Are you talking about going into next season? Well, he's coming off 50 touchdowns, so it's safe to put him in there. Yeah. Is it from just last season? He threw 50 touchdowns at 5,000 yards. He's the MVP. I think this is the first time the MVP hasn't been number one, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think Besides you're... Besides the one or one time J.J. Watt got it, but he was clearly Defensive Player of the Year. Yeah. Which I know Aaron Donald is here, too, and it's not that Aaron Donald's not the best player. It's like, Patty Mahomes has had an all-time season, and you don't even have him as the best quarterback, I mean. Yeah. Don't go me... Now, I'm not saying Drew Brees isn't great, but let's be honest, Drew Brees is old. And he was the MVP through 13 weeks of the season. Yeah. Roughly, but those last three to four games, he was... Pretty not pretty non spectacular, really game managing and comfortable. Where Patty Mahomes was still at, carry, throwing three hundred yards and three touchdowns. Yeah, I, I I don't get it either. I I look at Patty and I see what he did last year, and we all had this question mark going into last season about him. Like, will he be able to be what they expect him to be? You know, like you're replacing Alex Smith, who by all means we talk about it is a game manager. Not going to do the spectacular. He's going to play with it himself. He's going to get you some first downs. But Patty comes in, replaces him, and does everything they expected. And Times then 10. above and beyond, like, he just balled out last year. I don't know how he's not perennially number one until he decides he wants to quit playing the game. What's I mean, funny is if you go back to during last year's preseason, I mean, we're in the middle of the preseason. We talked about it a little bit last week. Patty struggled in the preseason. The reports were he was – doing terrible i think one practice he threw like seven interceptions the three touchdowns during seven on seven i don't remember the exact numbers but he had a terrible training camp preseason type like in the preseason games he wasn't terrible but training camps teams were worried about him like they were saying well, how can you trade Alex smith for him he's not ready well he broke that mold in half and ended yeah. up being just fine so i think he should have been number one this year if not at least the best quarterback yeah i mean i love drew Brees, but drew Brees and him just need to swap honestly like put drew Brees at four Put Patty at two, call it a day. Khalil Mack at three. Honestly, if he doesn't get hurt, he might take that number one spot. But yeah. that, that little bit of injury. And Aaron Donald, what can you say about the guy? More, best defensive and defensive lineman in the game. One of the best we've seen in years. I mean, I can't think of another guy in recent memory that's been as dominant as he is. I, Maybe yeah. J.J. Watt before the injuries, but even Aaron Donald's a little more disruptive, I think. Yeah, I look at Aaron Donald, and I purely – he's probably the first guy I've ever seen watching tape. And, that you know, growing up, that's what I, I was an offensive lineman, defensive lineman, you know. So I watch these guys. I watch Warren Sapp. I watch, you know, all these great rushers, Reggie White. And he's the first guy I can honestly say it looks like from an interior position. There's no offensive line in front of him. He's the quickest first step of a big guy I think I've ever seen. I mean, he, he breaks into the backfield quicker than <laughs> absolutely. Like, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think corners coming off the edge that are unblocked have a quicker first step than he does. It's insane. It's kind of weird. They talk about linemen like you master your hands. They're like, all linemen should be great boxers. Just get your hand out there, punch in the chest, that sort of thing. Aaron Donald's feet are stupid. Like, yeah. he looks like a tennis player, how quick he moves his feet. Like, I bet his ladder, watching him do ladder drills is terrifying. Because the way he jumps, he scoots, he slides. They talked about it on the one, his 100 profile video, how he basically jumps in the air during his pass rush. Plus, he can change angles, go from inside to outside, outside to inside, while moving his hands. He's kind of an enigma, like... They, they mentioned on that thing, too, like, don't teach young – don't use Aaron Donald tape to teach young kids because you can't do that. Yeah. No, like, I wish if I were teaching a young kid I could figure out a way to teach that, but no, you can't. What Aaron Donald has, you just can't teach. They talk you can't teach size. You can't teach whatever Aaron Donald has. I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe he's an alien. Maybe he's a robot. I don't know. But whoever cooked him up in a lab, I mean, bravo to you because that man is a monster. Like, he's just – he deserves the number one spot. You know, I, I joked about the Patty being number one until forever, but Aaron Donald has that actual potential. I mean, he probably has the most consistent potential to keep getting better year in and year out. The only thing I want to see more from him is maybe win. Like, he dominates, but he doesn't always seem to go out and win the game, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, we saw it against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. He had his moments, but he didn't really change the game. It's like, obviously, I don't know the exact numbers, but you know how sometimes you'll see one guy 10 sacks, another guy 10 sacks, but one guy feels significant because they're like third down sacks? Yeah. The other guy is a first down sack artist or a second down, and then they still continue the drive because they make it work. A lot of Aaron Donald's plays, like, they either come A, when the Rams have already scored like 30 because that's what they do, or B, they come really early in the game and then they kind of fizzle later. Like, obviously, yeah. he's dominant, best player in the league. I'm not trying to take away from him. I'm just saying that's the next thing I want to see from him. I want to see him take over games and prove to be – even more transcendental from the defensive line side because it's hard to take over a game as a defensive lineman. That's why quarterbacks are always the MVPs. That's why 
we basically thought quarterback would be number one because they yeah. changed the game on all assets. They helped the defense even more as well, too. You don't really see a defensive tackle change the game like that. No, exactly. And to use, like, our basketball references that we used already, it's like Steph Curry and KD. Like, when KD would get his points with the Warriors, it's just like, all right, well, we'll let him get his. Everybody's standing still and watching. It just doesn't really matter at that point. It doesn't affect the game. But when Curry's getting his points, it's in the flow of everything. It's when it's when they need the points, you know, is when Curry would step up and get the points, whereas KD was a lot of just get everything. out of my way. I'm yeah. better than everybody guarding me. It's fine, guys. Just sit over there and watch where Steph's like, everybody run around like psychos and somehow I'll get open. Yeah, exactly. And, so it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot like that. But I think you're right. I think Aaron Donald needs to figure out a way. And it's tough to say for alignment. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm sure his conditioning's up, but you're still a lineman. You're still carrying 250-plus pounds on your body. Like, you got to figure out a way to stay out there and be consistent every down. And, and I, he's probably the most consistent from a defensive lineman standpoint. I mean, definitely way more consistent than guys like Jadavian Clowney, but... And he's I, healthy, which is a big thing, too. He isn't yeah. getting injured like other guys like J.J., who was in his position a few years ago. Like, And once again, when I say that about these guys, I'm not saying they need to do more. I guess I should reward that, too. Like, it'd be nice if they could somehow... I just don't think they physically can, so that's why it's kind of crazy to see D-tackles and 3-4 D-ends at number one, because as awesome as their stats are, as disruptive as they are, they, he can have three sacks in a game, and they still lose by 10. It's kind of – it's a weird way it works. So it's kind of weird seeing a defensive lineman at the top. All the, all the much he deserves it, though, it's just – I look at Khalil Mack, who can cover as well as sack. It, he can do a little bit more. So if I'm taking a defensive player first in a first – with my first pick in a draft, I'm probably taking Khalil Mack over him because a little more versatility. But it's – how can you say Aaron Donald's not number one? I'm trying to, like, find more loopholes, I guess, into yeah, why there's... Patty wasn't number one, but – Honestly, that, I, th- I think the only reason Patty wasn't number one is because you have Drew Brees doing what Drew Brees does, and that just makes people enamored. I mean... 75% completion. I yeah. don't know. That's some Madden stuff right there. I mean. it, it is crazy what he did, but I still do think Patty deserves it over him. But Aaron Donald, I mean... I, maybe it's blasphemous to say this, but he, yeah, I remember coming out of the draft, everybody's like, all right, he'll be Warren Sapp. At like, best, yeah. Yeah, like his best will be Warren Sapp. And I'm sorry, Warren Sapp, maybe you want to come beat me up for saying this. <laughs> He's better than you already. Like, he, in my opinion, is the best defensive lineman we've seen since maybe Reggie White. Honestly, probably the best interior defensive lineman not named Joe Green, arguably, too. He's yeah. the guy that doesn't really play D-end. I mean, probably top five defensive lineman of all time, depending on how you rank him. But that's the thing with him. He can also play D-end. It's not like he oh, yeah, is he purely – it's not like he's purely set as a defense tackle. Like, whereas Warren Sapp, like – you're pretty much stuck on the interior. You're pretty much playing that three technique all the way through. He's he's Aaron Donald is agile enough to you can step him out and play him as defensive end. So and he did play D end in a three four this recently, so he basically played the JJ Watt role and dominated just like he did. Yeah, and so it's it's a crazy to see. I, I honestly don't I don't know if we'll ever see anything like this again. And if we do, wow. If we don't, I'm gonna enjoy the mm-hmm. heck out of watching this while we can because this is crazy. But. Anything else you want to mention on the top 100 before we move on? I mean, I, a lot of the, I don't really want to kick a lot of players off, but there were some snubs and there were some positioning issues. Uh, there were some questions we could probably go on about this all day, but I think we kind of covered all the important things. We covered the snubs. We covered a few of the guys in the top 10. Anything else that we missed out on? I'm going blank right now, but did Dak make the list? Please tell me he didn't. He did not make the list. There, all right, no, nope, the list is good in my opinion. <laughs> otherwise, this might be the best list they've had in years. But no, Kirk Cousins. I mean, sorry, they did have Kirk Cousins, but no Dak. I mean, I figured if one of them make it, they'd both make it. Honestly, so I was kind of surprised because, and then Carson Wentz, even though he's broken for a lot of the year, he made the bottom of the list. Even yeah, you know, that's I don't know. I guess Carson, it's a lot of. You see the potential, and you're like, I want him to be good, and they're kind of like speaking into existence, and it'll become truth. Like uh, maybe that's what they're trying to play at. I don't know. And they've seen him at his peak when he's at his best. He's pretty dope. He can make some magnificent plays. The problem is, at his best, he tends to break himself. He did it in college, and he's still doing it now. So we'll yeah. see. I think he, I think he'll be fine. I think he's an MVP candidate next year if he doesn't fall apart. Oh, definitely. I think you know probably you mentioned at his best. I think at his best, he's like a more fragile version of Steve Young. Um, not gonna. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's not gonna run all over you like Steve Young could have. He's gonna get pretty close. So he's gonna but, do a lot yeah. of running when it's there. He's gonna try to run somebody over, and that's what's gonna mess him up again. So this is what his problem is. He has an Andrew Luck problem where he sees somebody and he sees the first down marker and he wants to just drive right through it. And the problem with Carson is you have a top three offensive line in of football. You don't need to do that, and you're yeah. a competent pocket passer. And when you break the puck, you should be looking for your outstanding thousands of receivers or Zach Ertz, but. 
Yeah. Sometimes when you have that mentality, like he has, he's a very blue collar quarterback. It's like I'm gonna get that first down, and this guy, this little man over here, is not stopping me. Exactly. Well, all right. So we just talked about the NFL, and we're kind of segueing into college, and we just talked about two great former college quarterbacks. Well, they just released the coaches' poll for the top 25. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm torn. I'm excited for this season of college football, but I will say, looking at it, I just can't help but notice the top four are probably the way it's going to stay for most of the season. I mean, pretty much the top six, I don't see anything of that change. If you look at Clemson's number one, no way. Big shocker here. (laughs) Yeah, right. Alabama's number two, shut the front door. And then Georgia, number three, not really a big surprise either. Oklahoma, number four. Well, I, they're kind of the one out of those three that I think has a chance to get bounced out. We'll see how Jalen Hurts does. Yeah. Ohio State, they're always there. LSU, they'll be there for a while, then they'll lose a game and disappear. Michigan, they'll be fine until they play Ohio State. So, I mean, realistically, I'm excited for everyone besides the top three. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the top three are kind of like, ah, uh, whatever, I don't really care. Uh, I will say the I, I feel like Alabama and Georgia, um, they kind of have the same foe to deal with. I'm going to harp on this Auburn bus, but – for the SEC, the that's, the SEC West Championship runs through Auburn. It's going to run through a triangle of Auburn, LSU, and Bama. Whoever wins the two out of two out of three between those three teams will be the SEC West champion. And the SEC East it runs through Tennessee. I mean, you got Georgia and Florida both in the top ten, and I mean they're going to have to both beat Tennessee and then beat themselves and beat one or the other. You know, they got the battle in the head, uh, between the hedges. And now it's finally turning back into what it used to be with Dan Mullen coming back to Florida. It'll be exciting to see uh, because that is a matchup that will be interesting. Uh, you got Jake Fromm for Georgia. Just whether he can stay consistent and be the transcendental quarterback that everybody's been wanting him to be. The reason why Justin Fields transferred to Ohio State, like you know, like he is he's the number one. That like, can he continue that or will he keep getting injured? He kind of has that same Andrew Luck type of issue. Where he likes to, you know, bowl somebody over for an extra yard and gets himself hurt. Like, you know, I love to see it from a kid, but for somebody like Jake Fromm, who has his NFL career ahead of him, like, dude. And oh. he's not the biggest dude. He's not a freight train like Andrew and Cam and Carson, those guys. Like, he's good size, but he's not He's not a bulldozer. He's, exactly. not a tr- he's not a train to get out of the way of. Exactly. So we talked about those guys. Those are pretty much the key teams. We know about those. OU, I'm curious with Jalen Hurts. Like, does he step right in and become the next Heisman winning quarterback at Oklahoma? Like, yeah, do they have him, a three-peat here? You saw Baker Mayfield, precision pocket pass, or a little mobile but a pure thrower of the football, win a Heisman. Next year, Kyler Murray, the exact opposite, the ultimate scrambler playmaker, basically, the Russell Westbrook type guy, if you will, comes in, wins a Heisman, looks fantastic the entire year, minus like maybe two halves altogether. Yeah. Now Jalen Hurts, who's kind of a pure runner who can make throws, does – does Lincoln Riley, can he make an offense around that? Or is, I'm curious. I want to see how it works out because you're going to have a bunch of five-star receivers. They always yeah. do year in and year out. One of the better old lines. You're going to put up points, but how many points? Yeah, you still have CeeDee Lamb on the roster too. So it's not like you're losing a whole lot. I mean, they he was arguably the best playmaker for Oklahoma outside of Kyler Murray last season. So, you know, that's that's something to, to talk about too. And But, yeah, Jalen Hurts, it's not like he transferred because he was bad or anything. He just transferred because he knows he's that good. He, and he wants sit. to. He wants to play. Like, don't get me wrong. Tua's good. I don't think Tua's all the hype. I don't think. I don't think Jalen Hurts should ever have been replaced by him. Honestly, I don't know if Tua's the second coming necessarily. Yeah. But I will say Jalen Hurts going to Oklahoma. I can't think of a better place for him to go. Um, you know, this is kind of. I, I'll, I'll say it early on now. I feel like this season will be the story of transfer quarterbacks, um, because you got Jalen Hurts at Oklahoma. Whether he pans out. And then right behind them, you have Justin Fields at Ohio State. And that's another guy. He's a runner. He's a run-first guy. That's why he transferred from Georgia. He was not going to beat out Jake Fromm with Jake Fromm's passing ability and Fields' lack of it, really. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's not a bad passer by any means. He's a lot like Jalen Hurts. He'll hit the open guy, but... He's not going to pick you apart from the yeah. pocket. He's not going to Trevor Lawrence you to death, more or less. Exactly. He's not going to fit it in the tight windows. So it'll be... That's in... I'm intrigued to see how they do, um, especially Ohio State. You lose Urban Meyer. How does that work out, too? Like, Are they still the same dominant force losing one of the best college football coaches in recent memory, or yeah. is it just a pipeline at this point where it doesn't even matter who's at the helm? Yeah, I mean, did they finally build the machine and then it just works itself? I mean, I don't know. I remember watching Utah for a while there after when Urban Meyer was there and then when he left. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, they had just won a Fiesta Bowl, and then he left, and then he lost all those seniors as well. So obviously the, the program is going to rebuild, but they fell off until Kyle Whittingham kind of brought him back to life. And, you know, Utah we see also in this list, so they're, they're still there. And then Florida, another team, once Urban Meyer left, they kind of fell off till just recently, and now yeah. they're back They're back in the top ten. They're, they, I think they could be a threat. You mentioned them too in the SEC. Yeah. You never know with them. Like Florida seems like a team that always has good players. They just haven't put it together since Urban Meyer. Yeah. I think this year, I think this could be a year where they make some noise. So we used to have a joke about Georgia calling them Thugga. Uh, I hate to say it, but I feel like that's more Florida than anybody else. They're just kind of – you got a lot of guys on there. You just don't have a lot of guys that make good common sense decisions. Um, they seem to get themselves in trouble more than they should. And I don't know if you know people know about Gainesville, but you're not – there's not a whole lot to do in Gainesville. So I don't know how, what they're doing to get themselves in trouble. Like there's not a whole lot to get yourself in trouble down there. It doesn't make sense. But if they can put it all together, and Dan Mullen is a guy that he can, he seems to be able to put it together for a team. Like he did it with Mississippi State. He's the reason Dak Prescott is in the NFL and is possibly one of the best fourth round draft picks to come out of recent memory. So I hate to say it, but he did turn Dak Prescott into a decent NFL quarterback. Not, not a great by any means, but I'll well, never you made get... it perfectly clear. You don't think of him as great by any means. <laughs> I just have to make sure everybody understands. So we mentioned those guys. What are two teams you think on this top 25 list that can make some noise and actually be that fourth playoff team? Because we're going to basically assume Clemson, Alabama is a sure thing. Georgia is a 97% sure thing. Oklahoma is probably like a 50. They're probably the one that could be knocked off. Who do you yeah. think could be that fourth playoff team between those three? You know, honestly, i actually going to go down a little bit further. I see Texas. Interesting. I see Texas actually making a push for it. You got Sam Ellinger there. He's made strides. Very big strides. I don't. I don't see him not continuing that path. And I, I do think they keep building. And they. This might be the year for Texas. They. They had a great recruiting class. Um, I do think they'll make noise. And for the love of Pete, I feel like some. The other possibility for somebody is a Pac-12 team finally decides to come from the depths of Hades, wherever they've been hiding at. And make noise. I see Oregon probably being that team. I mean, you beat me to it. That was gonna be my pick for it too. You got Justin Herbert, probably the best quarterback in the country. Honestly, he's a, gonna be a top five NFL pick, barring some sort of travesty or fall off. They've kind of rebuilt under Chip Kelly, with Chip Kelly being gone underneath his regime. I think they're gonna be a powerhouse on offense. I think they're not gonna be as much mix and matchy, a bunch of reverses and misdirection. I think they're just gonna piece teams up with a more traditional looking offense this year. Yeah, and I mean definitely. And, you know, they, I mentioned Auburn earlier that the SEC West title runs through it, but they start out against Auburn, Oregon. I mean, it's in 21 days, I think. Something like that, yeah. You know, so Auburn, Oregon kicks off our season, and, and that's going to be a big game to decide who makes the noise. If Oregon is for real, we'll find out against that front front seven, front eight for Auburn. I mean, that'll be that'll be the telling feature i mean of all all of auburn's question marks their one solid side is their defensive line and their linebackers it's just a matter of i mean they don't have a quarterback yet so if oregon can come in and and you know give a game plan and actually just kill up like just piece piece apart auburn like we talked like you talked about i do see oregon being that team and one team in the pac-12 that's kind of high on the list they're at number 12 too Washington, the Huskies, they're always up there. The last four or so years, they've always been close. They did make the college football playoff once not too long ago. Got blasted by Alabama, of course. Yeah. They're always there, but they never can pull the trigger. They never quite make that leap. They always lose a game or two that they should. So is this the year? I mean, they've had a lot of NFL draft prospects, too. I mean, from Vita Vea, Sidney Jones, Miles Gaskin, Dante Pettis, like the lit- Will Disley. The list goes on and on. They're practically a pipeline to the NFL at this point. They're Alabama North Northwest. Yeah. Without winning in college, unfortunately. So, do they get over the hump, or are they rightfully ranked at twelve? That's what I'm curious to see. I mean, they're ahead of Oregon. Looking at this thing, they're basically picked to finish at the top of the Pac-12. Which, if that's the case, I'm afraid that means that we're not going to see a Pac-12 team necessarily. Yeah. Back to Hades with you, if that. <laughs> yeah. I think they're going to have to step up and they're going to have to win out. They're going to have to go undefeated. Oregon, kind of the same thing. You lose to Auburn, maybe you run the you run the rest of the way. Washington State's another one in the Northwest. Like yeah, last you can't, year. can't, can't, uh, can't second guess the uh, the Matt Pirate up there. Never gonna. Mike Leach is 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 just a best crazy best interview coach. in college football, hands down. Anyway, but how do they go? I mean, last year everyone thought they were actually a team to be reckoned with, and then of course in the Apple Cup they choke it away. They had a 
pretty good game against ISU in that bowl game, too. I mean, Keem Butler, David Montgomery, there's some real NFL talent there. That defensive line on Iowa State is no joke. They terrorized Will Greer. And Gardner Minshew pieced him up pretty well and looked pretty good. So I'm curious how they bounce back, losing your quarterback. But with Mike Leach, he can usually plug somebody in there and get them rolling. So Yeah, I feel like they say that I feel like that's a system type thing with his offenses. It's always kind of been that way, like plug and play for a quarterback. As long as he can throw the ball, I can I can run an offense. It's kind of his philosophy. And then when he has the really good ones, that's when you see him as a national title contender. But if not, they're always going to be good anyway. Like, yeah, we'll we'll see how they play. I don't know. I'm really. I'm glad you mentioned the Pac-12 because growing up, they that with USC and Cal yeah. and those like they were a powerhouse, and now they almost just seem like an afterthought. Stanford with guys like Luck, Toby Gerhardt, Zach Ertz. Yeah. No. I, I, it's crazy. I mean, it's it's so SEC dominated lately. It's just they had the money, so they have been the ones leading the way. And don't get me wrong, I am a fan of an SEC team, but growing up, I did watch Pac-12, Mountain West games. You know. I remember the 2004 Alex Smith led Utah Utes beating Pittsburgh in the Fiesta Bowl. I mean, the original Boise State led by now Washington coach Peterson. And, you know, it, he has built a great program up there in Washington, by the way. I do have to say that he has. They went from a joke to an absolute force of nature. Honestly. Yeah, they uh, they turned back into what Washington was, you know. Um, a couple teams that I just looking at this list that I'm kind of curious about. Uh, I'm definitely curious Wisconsin. There's not a lot of holes there, but is there enough firepower to get you into the top ten, into the top five, and win your conference can and you possibly beat, go undefeated? Can you beat Ohio State? Can you beat Michigan? That's basically what it comes down to with Wisconsin. Because with, with you're going to beat pretty much everyone else. Maybe Iowa gives you some difficulty here or there, but Wisconsin's basically that ultimate bend but don't break, pretty good but not extravagant type of team. Like They're your ultimate role player that's always right there, basically in a team form. Exactly. Them, uh, UCF, who, by the way, has made a lot of noise lately, but they, they, they've made it with McKenzie Milton at quarterback. Um, he's hurt, still recovering from that awful knee injury. Yeah, that was hope he, hope he comes back healthy when he comes back. Um, their backup, Mac, he's hurt. And now you have Brandon Wimbush, which I don't know if you remember, but is a Notre Dame, court, a Notre Dame transfer guy. He was the guy that transferred from Notre Dame when they played Alabama in the National Championship game, and they got wiped. So yeah, that was how, the worst national title game in recent memory, arguably. How can he lead a new possible, you know, Power 5 disruptee in UCF? Like, can he lead them to their recent successes? Is he good enough still? I mean, or did that Alabama experience kind of just ruin him? I don't know. I'm curious to see what he does. Um, you mentioned him earlier, Iowa State. They're in the top 25, as is Iowa. Kind of brings back the... Uh, the Heartland era era of football. So hmm. we'll see how they do. I, my question with Iowa is kind of the same: is do they have enough offensive firepower? Their defense pretty good. How they how do they rebuild after losing two tight ends? I mean, you, not very many people lose two tight ends in the same draft, let alone two first round draft picks at tight end in the same draft. And that's a year after George Kittle, who no one saw this coming. Like, he wasn't even recruited by anybody in that. Yeah. Iowa basically just kind of took him because of an old family relation, honestly. So I was like, oh, okay, we'll take him. He's okay. And then, bam, NFL, second-best tight end of football, arguably. Yeah. Weirdly enough, they have a new tight end. I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I haven't been able to find it. But he has yet to play a down with Iowa. But he has so much – but Iowa's got so much clout as tight end. You, he's already in – already being listed as a potential Mackey Award winner for this year. It's crazy. Like, he hasn't played a down yet of college football, and he's already consider- considered a potential Mackey Award winner. That's just how – basically, you, that's the respect that I was regarded with as far as tight ends. They're like what Penn State used to be for linebackers. Yeah, I remember those years. And then, you know, that's that's at the bottom list. I think I'm curious about what they might do. But at the top list, I have two guys that are just way overrated, and I grew up one a fan of one of them, so this hurts me a little bit. But Notre Dame – and Michigan. Notre Dame's entirely too high. We have seen this time and time again. As soon as they actually break through, they fall apart because they're missing. They're just missing that extra X factors. I like Notre Dame. They are always their 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 offensive line pipeline. We've talked about Quinn Nelson, Zach Martin, Mike McGlinchey. My yeah. goodness, they you could build an All Pro offensive line, best ever in just NFL Notre Dame guys at this point. Yeah. And you mentioned a Michigan. Once again, they'll go like nine and one. They'll play Ohio State for the right to go to the college football playoff, and they'll choke. Yeah, yeah. I see. I mean, I don't know. I, they have Shea Patterson at quarterback. I just don't see it with Shea Patterson. I don't think he's a 
he's prolific a, quarterback like what everybody claims he is. I just don't see it from him. I think he's a good average quarterback. He's a college rice, quarterback. In the right know? situation, he can you can win with him, and they did win with him, but he's not like what Dwayne Haskins. He doesn't have that yeah. extra factor. I mean, I would honestly take shoelaces over him again. <laughs> like, bring that back. I, I just, I just don't get it. I don't. I, I don't know if Harbaugh is going to be sticking around long term. I don't. I think this is his year. If he fa- if they fall apart, I think he's gone. I think last year was the year too. I think I think he's out now. You lost you lost way too much talent in recent years. Like, I don't know what they have left that really is like. Oh yeah, that's a reason they'll be. Maybe you say if you're a real believer in Shea Patterson. Oh, he just needed another year with Harbaugh. They're ready to go now. It's not really how college football works. Unfortunately, you don't get like four years to build it. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean. I wouldn't be surprised to see Michigan State, who's also on this list, beat Michigan. You know, they, Harbaugh Mi- tends to lose to Michigan State and Ohio State a lot. It's kind of weird because as an NFL coach, he was outstanding, but in college, he's just been really good. Yep. And then, last but not least, the last team on this list. We just, I just want to throw them out there because bravo to them for making this a top twenty-five program. They built it up over recent years. Northwestern in the top twenty-five of the coaches poll, getting some respect. Don't get me wrong; they're probably not going to be. They're not that be, team, but they were they were in contention for the whatever Big Ten set division they're in, the Legends division I think with Ohio State up oh. until that Ohio State game where they lost. I mean, they were in contention to win that division. So maybe I eat my words at the end of the season, and of all teams to come out of the Big Ten, Northwestern is the team. That would be a doozy. Out of all that, you have five teams on this list, and they're the one that pulls it through. That'd be great. But yeah. they've done it through hard work, determination, that sort of thing. Like everything you love, the great story, whatever you want to call it, the American dream, however you want to slice it up. However, it ends here, at number twenty-five. I think. I yeah. think if you play one through twenty-four, they probably lose by double digits. And maybe against like a Stanford or something that could keep it close, but I'm not. I don't know. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, honestly, the biggest reason I want to mention this Northwestern thing is they're the reason we're having this conversation about paying players. They're the guys that tried to, to form a union for their own team. I mean, that's – you know, Northwestern's not known as a athletic school. It's no not way. It's not an athletic school. Uh, yeah, you see them on top 25 list, you're like, what? No. But, no, seriously, they're not a top 20 – or they're not an athletic school. That, like, that's not what they're known for. So they're a J school, they're a journalism school, and – really good one at that yeah point. actually yeah one of the best that you can possibly go to um guys all over espn fox sports are all are from there but you know they're an intelligent group and so for them to be athletically getting the prowess or getting their recognition they deserve along with the conversation they started i i, I like to see it it'd be interesting if they met let's hypothetically say they run the table they go undefeated they make themselves a contender for that playoff with that conversation too gets very very interesting at that yeah. point too it's already interesting as it is, just with the narrative built around, like, remember Shavaz Napier? We're hungry, man, right after winning the title game. Yeah. That made some changes with Northwestern. Maybe maybe they get on a roll because nothing makes nothing inspires change quite like winning and saying yeah. it on the big stage, so who knows? Yeah, that'd be, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to bet on it. No, you, not, not by any means. I'm not, a, I'm not that faithful of a betting man to uh, to risk it all on Northwestern, but that would be, that just makes a really interesting point. Like, could they pull that off? So That'd since be, we're talking about it, I'll just go ahead and throw this in there. We didn't think about this at all, but I'm curious about it. Do you think college athletes should get paid? And if so, how do you think they go about it? I think the only way to do it is a call, is a stipend. I do think they deserve something for being an athlete, but I, I, I do Free think... tuition doesn't quite... I, I will say I don't know if... Like, don't get me wrong. Tuition is a big deal, but like... I don't know. For how much money they're bringing into the college? Like, we're talking millions and millions if not billions of dollars an industry like if you're working you you know in our in our current jobs if we were bringing in seven figures just to that company and we were only making thirty thousand a year you'd want some money right well that hit me right in the heart because you basically broke down everything for me but all right (laughs) that's how i feel too and i'm just like i don't know i just i think they put so much on the line for so little I, I don't get me wrong. I do think tuition's a big deal. I do think room and board's a big deal, but and all the like, they get a lot of stuff just from like the different team deals, like yeah. Nike deals, shoes, all that stuff. A lot of notoriety, like putting that on your resume too afterwards. I think it's that's a big one deal. thing that goes under under noticed is, let's say Northwestern, a kid graduates from there that played football. They're a decent receiver, maybe the third guy, something like that, caught five touchdowns, whatever. Yeah. He wants to go and be a journalist somewhere. He wants to be a sports journalist. He's gonna if he could say like, oh by the way, I played. Division one college football, he's gonna get so many. Like, he, let's say his 
real is pretty average, like someone next to him is better, they're going to look at that and be like, oh, a former college football player? Come on down. Yeah. Especially if it's in the area, too. Like, that's just going to boost ratings. I mean, it's a business at the end of the day. And you yeah. can do that with across platforms, honestly. That's how guys like Ryan Hollins get a job. God, he's terrible on ESPN. My <laughs> God. But, no, I mean, to, to sum it up, yes, I do think they should get paid. I do think the only way to do it would be a stipend format or maybe pay them after their time in college. Maybe give them a lump sum after their time in college of a percentage based off of how much money was earned during that four-year, five-year period. One potential idea, too, I thought, is maybe, like, include pay them, but inclu- don't pay their tuition. Like, say, like, here, we think you're, like, the percent thing. It'd be like, yeah. you could pay your tuition with this, or you can kind of rack it up and maybe plan on paying it afterwards. But say you're hungry right now, all right, your tuition costs 30000 a year, just going to pick a number. All right, we'll give you $30,000 a year, basically, because that's what we, you bring in, more or less. You can use it on tuition. You can use it how you want. And then, or you know what I mean, like just yeah. we'll give you well, certain money, but it won't cover tuition. We're not gonna cover tuition and pay you. Yeah, there was a fl- there was a thought about this with Zion Williamson, talking about paying him a million dollars, and honestly for a yeah. year for his one year at Duke, and and honestly he probably brought in that much merchandising and everything, and that's probably would have been his percentage of it. So if you are going off your your thought of it, that's actually a really good way to do it. Like Duke is like sixty thousand dollars a year, so he pays a, probably three quarters of a year's tuition. Or whatever you know, he actually went to school for, and what, sixty thousand of the one million dollars, he keeps nine hundred and forty thousand dollars. Like, okay, sign me up. Yeah, you can buy some shoes that don't fall apart then. So you'll be yeah. set. <laughs> you can create so, your own at that point. Exactly. So there, I think there are ways around it. I, I think giving them free tuition and paying them, that's where people get lost. It's like, well, hold on a minute. Now you're yeah. getting free tuition. You are getting paid because that's a lot of money that. That goes under the radar, kind of, because they also get free food, free board. That's a lot of – people People get paid to cook there. I mean, like, you got to pay their salaries. Like Yeah, I just I, – I keep looking at it, and I, I kind of just look at the hours they have to they have to run on it. And, I mean, we're talking, like, they're up at 4 in the morning for practices, workouts. They don't probably go to sleep until midnight because of checks, you know, room checks, meetings, mandatory study hours, actually doing homework – for yeah. those that actually do it. So all four of them got you. Yeah, exactly. You know, the offensive linemen basically. Are Not the ones even the that... starting offensive linemen either. <laughs> yeah. But no, like, I, I don't know. I just, I look at it and they're spending basically 20 hours of their day focus on football and school. Whereas most students are 10 hours of their day, 12 hours of their day that they're focused on it. Then they have maybe an after school job if they have to work one. Um, I know we both did. So we're included in that. So that's about 20 – I mean, we're, we're working about 20 hours at that point. So, yeah, I wish we would have gotten a little bit extra too. But, you know, we weren't bringing in six figures into our and school. And the one goals. difference too is though they kind of chose that life. Like you didn't have to be a student. Like, don't yeah, know, I agree no. with you. Like they put it – not trying to disrespect any of the effort. I just think there's a way to do it. But at the same time, you can't have your cake, eat it too, and then get some cookies on the side. Like there's yeah. got to be – there's got to be some middle ground. And I think in the next, let's say, 10 years they can maybe work it out. So like college athletes 10 years from now, Zion Williamson 2.0 happens – in 2035 he'll probably get paid a million dollars like that or whatever he makes in but at the same time it won't be a million dollars plus do whatever the hell you want all throughout college so i think there's a way i think there's a way i just it has to be logistically worked out i am no businessman i am no expert <laughs> yeah no, no. i i'm not a money guy i like i like to have it and i like to spend it but i do not know how to make it grow on trees exactly well to kind of segue this into money man uh main event last night ufc Whew. uh that money man, Colby Covington. Yeah, money man. I yeah, I'm just calling that. him that because he knows the he knows the press. He knows Asian Orange. You know. Yeah, I, I said that out loud. That was it. Going strictly back to the fights. Now, it would, I got to give him credit. He has been off for a year. He hasn't fought in over a year. Everyone hates him, or they just think he's an idiot because he has kind of a shtick that he goes by. If you haven't really watched it, you can watch a five minute highlight clip on YouTube. A little cringeworthy. Clearly, it feels very fake and rehearsed. But the dude can throw down, man. I mean, he went in against Robbie Lawler, who anyone who knows fighting knows Robbie Lawler. He's terrifying. He hits harder than a brick truck. You don't take him down, and he's got a chin of granite. Very few people have been able to knock him out. Kobe walked right at him nonchalantly, like, okay, yeah, moving my head, touch, touch, touch. He threw over 500 significant strikes. That was a record. He attempted, I think, 20 takedowns. Can you just imagine that? He hasn't fought in over a year, and that's what he's able to do. Plus, he had a cut over his eye, which has been confirmed after the fight. He couldn't really train for the last few weeks either because it would open up. It was right below the eyebrow, and it's a pretty gnarly cut. You can look on Twitter and find it. So that dude's cardio is on another level, his output. And if you look, so technically sound. 
His left hand was taped to his ear, so he's like, all right, you're not going to crack me with that. <laughs> then he's going to use his shoulder to protect from Robbie's left. He basically neutralized any chance of him getting clipped with one shot and killed. I mean, he could get hit with one and Robbie hits hard enough where it's like, oh, shit, that hurt. But he neutralized any chance of getting starched, more or less, barring the perfect, unavailable, gift-from-the-heavens shot. Yeah. And he never got out of Robbie's face. He didn't step backwards. He kept going forwards. And when you look at them standing next to each other, it's like, okay, clearly Robbie's going to kill him because Colby's kind of wiry, not overly muscular. He's in good shape. You can see abs. He's His t- chest is kind of toned, but he doesn't have, like, giant pulsating pecs that look like they could choke a coconut. But then when he goes after <laughs> – you look at Robbie, who's an absolute monster – who many people have accused on being on roids, but no one's proved anything, obviously. They meet in the middle, not a problem. Kobe was not a phase at all. His output was amazing. His boxing was tight, though. The body, the head, the legs. He had a few switch kicks to the body that they sound... That's pretty much what they sounded like. You can see Robbie wince if you look at him again in slow motion. Kobe set himself up. If he doesn't get a title fight now, I know Jorge George Masvidal with the flying knee from hell that killed Ben Askren's soul and KOing Darren Till completely stiff. But Colby Covington was your interim champ. He's on like a seven-fight win streak or something like that. He made a statement here. Let George either fight somebody else or just sit and wait. Colby and Kamaru Usman, Kamaru, Marty, whatever his damn name is, they fight next. They have to. They had their little back and forth, which is terrible to watch. <laughs> After the fight, was, was... it was pretty cringy. Those two have to match up. You have two cardio kings, both really good wrestling, both decent striking. Neither one's terrifying, but they both have a lot of output. Kamaru's a little more kick-based. Colby's a little more boxing. I just want to see those two meet in the middle and just basically collide. And then George could fight the winner or however they want to work that out. Masvidal's awesome. If he wants to fight, he's been talking Conor McGregor. That could be fun if they make that happen. It won't, but it would be cool. That'd be a lot of money. They'd talk Conor out of retire- like his semi-retirement right now. It'd be a weird scenario where both guys are very hateable, too. Like, neither one's a likable guy. Like I like them both personally, but like on paper, to a casual fan, they look at George, especially after that Masvidal win, his showboating afterwards and stuff. They're like, oh, poor sportsmanship. That was so unclass. Eh, it's a game of fisticuffs that happened. You look at Conor, enough said he threw a dolly through a bus. I mean, I don't need to get too much <laughs> yeah, more into it than yeah. that. So that's a fight that could be interesting, but I don't think it's going to happen. Honestly, the UFC is in a pretty good spot, but I don't think you can shaft Colby here. I think you just got to give it to him. Masvidal's won two fights in a row. They've been two big fights. He's probably fighter of the year. But either have him wait till after Colby and Kamaru throw down, or just have Masvidal fight someone else, if you will. I mean, the, the welterweight division is looking pretty nice right now. I And then you still have Tyron Woodley sitting there like, hey, as soon as I get healthy, I'm coming back. Yeah. And then there's other guys like Leon Edwards, Rafael Dos Anjos. Welterweight is pretty good right now. I'm not going to quote Colby, but it's great right now. Yeah. Not gonna say make great it make it great again. I'm not playing that. <laughs> no, and for those that don't know what we what we're talking about with the 500 significant strikes, that's not just 500 strikes that just love tap somebody. That's like a solid punch. I dare I dare anybody who thinks that's not a lot to walk up to a heavy bag and land 500 punches solidly on that bag, like not half-assing it, but solidly land those 500 punches. I bet most of us couldn't even make it through 200 without dying. Honestly, just go throw them. They don't like a lot of Colby's were just tap, tap, tap. They weren't hard, but they connected. Like it's yeah, they're it's solid death by connections. A thousand yeah. paper cuts. Would you rather get cut once by a knife in the arm, or would you rather get a thousand paper cuts on that arm? It's gonna suck no matter what. But take I mean, me once. I don't want. A thousand I don't want to deal cuts. with that, especially for twenty-five straight minutes. And then right when you think it stopped, boom, he shoots underneath you and takes you down, and then continues to just wear on you and grind on you and hit That's you. That's crazy. It's, like five hundred punches. I'm just sitting here thinking in my head. If I were to sit here and go throw 500 punches, I would be dead. My arms would be noodles. But then on top of that, he's fighting another human being who is moving, striking. Hitting him back. Try, yeah, trying to, to get his legs, like doing everything in his power to beat the man throwing 500 punches. And that's just the ones he landed. Like that's what's crazy to me is that's just landed punches. So he probably threw another maybe 150. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. I think it was thrown 500 and landed somewhere in the 300s. But it's, oh, okay. it's so pretty ridiculous. Ins- insane numbers though. I mean just – I, I don't do me wrong. I don't. I'm not a fan of his shtick, but it does feel a lot like that WWE heel method. I mean, he walked out to "You suck." I mean, yeah, the Kurt Angle "You up, suck." Yeah. Like that's what remind. Like immediately once I saw that, I was like, okay, he's definitely a WWE heel. Like this is this is 100 percent rehearsed. Bravo to you, Dane White. But like, I don't know, man. You can't do that and, and not be an athlete. That is insane. I <laughs> all the respect in the world to him and his training because that's just. That's nuts. I just it's it's unfathomable. And what's crazy is that's not even factoring in the takedown attempts. Like he shot, yeah. I think, twenty takedowns. That's exhausting. Getting them, not getting them, either way, it's exhausting. That will wear you out too. 
fantastic performance. Give him a title shot. Hopefully he stops being sounding like a goofball, but that's probably not going to happen. He kind of comes across like an idiot with some of these interviews, but the man can throw down. You cannot take that away from him. He is 15-1 and one now, arguably something like that. Kamar Usman's 14-1. and one. I think they're both... They both each have one loss, but a bunch of wins. They beat some high-quality contenders. Who has a better resume than Colby right now? I mean, he the same guys Kamaru Usman beat with Damian Maya and the Rafael Rafael dos Anjos. Colby Covington beat them first, and he arguably beat them worse. Like he he does have a point there when he said Kamaru got his quote unquote sloppy seconds on that one. That's so crazy. he beat them first, and he beat them arguably more convincingly, depending on how you look at it. And then he just took out Robbie Lawler in dominant fashion. Kamaru did the similar thing to. Tyron Woodley, so I think these two just have to meet. There's no other way around it. Yeah. All right, well, if Colby Covington is listening, uh, if you need a PR spin artist to make you sound a little more intelligent, give us a call. Uh, we got you covered. <laughs> or just send us a message on Twitter or Facebook. We got you covered, man. We'll get you We'll get you sounding real smart-like. And please quit saying that you get your cardio from the bedroom. It just sounds terrible, man. It just sounds <laughs> awful. I'm sorry. I mean, I know what you're trying to get at, and it it's just doesn't work. Yeah, but no. If, you, wherever you actually get your cardio from, keep doing it because it's amazing. If you actually get it from the bedroom somehow, give you a round of applause because that's ridiculous. But just stop saying that, man. It just sounds awful. I know you're. I know what you're trying to do, but you're you're pretty much set now. Try not just tra- tweak things a little bit. Yeah, you're not Lewis. You can't you can't be getting away with saying my balls is hot. You know like, what? That might actually be an upgrade. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. And then but, the fun fact for people who didn't know, Colby Covington actually used to room with John Jones back in college too. So there's a little bit of. There was something interesting going on in that college in that college back in the day. I mean, John Jones, who can't stay out of trouble and can't get out of his own way and always seems to do something stupid. And then Colby, who manages to stay out of trouble but always says something stupid. That You can imagine they had some fun times back in the day. I guess he's just so white he didn't need the extra cocaine or something. I don't know. I don't it's know. Just... They had a really, they had a really <laughs> odd dynamic there. That's, that's an odd dichotomy. Somebody who gets busted with hookers and cocaine and another guy who's just – his worst crime is that he's a Donald Trump fan. Like – I don't know. Maybe, I guess maybe some people might say that's worse, but I, to me, I look at it. I think that's hilarious that they were room, roommates, and one was all into all the negative stuff. The other's like, ah, oh, I'm just. He's a pretty straightforward guy. I mean, he says a lot of stupid things, and he puts off a weird persona. But you don't really see him getting in trouble, honestly. I mean, he and posts he a lot fight. of terrible videos with with girls and stuff like that. They're like, oh, going to get my cardio in the shower real quick and stuff like that. But. It works for him. He throws down. Good on you. Whatever you got to do, man. <laughs> so when those two match up, it's going to be great. I can't wait. I hope the fight's actually made soon. Everyone seems pretty healthy. I mean, Colby walked out of there a little bruised up. Not too bad. Kamaro's recovering from whatever it was. I think it was like 18 hernias or whatever he had. Because it seemed like he had a double hernia in that fight, if I remember correctly. So Oh, man. We'll see how they bounce back. And then next week, not next week, I think it's the week after, we got Stipe Miocic. And, of course, Daniel Cormier, the rematch, heavyweight title. Can't wait. Nate Diaz, Anthony Pettis. Oh, my God, the grudge match. Does Anthony Pettis get a highlight real KO? Does Nate Diaz return and overwhelm him? If it goes to the ground, you got two of the best ground guys in the in the game. That's a barn burner. That's the people's main event, no matter what you say. Then Paulo Costa and Yoel Romero, the USADA battle royale for supremacy of past slash failed slash what the heck drug test. Two guys that are not <laughs> physically capable of being made in, in nature, but... Apparently they are, so that'll be a fun one too. So that fight card I can't wait for as well. That'll be an exciting one, especially the the Miocic and, and Cormier fight. I mean, we talked about that multiple times already on the podcast that it's coming up and it is it is one to watch. And, you know, this decides kind of the greatest heavyweight maybe ever. Realistic, whoever wins this one you can say is the best heavyweight of all time because yeah. Stipe has the most offenses and he's beat pretty much everyone besides DC at this point at heavyweight. And yeah, I mean, as far as fighters that matter, not early fight losses, DC hasn't even lost a round of heavyweight yet, so. That's crazy. Well, we got a lot to look forward to. Anything else in the UFC fight world that you want to talk about before? That's kind of the biggest one. We'll cover some more as we get closer to it. Valentina Shevchenko, probably the best women's fighter in the world, depending on, between her and Amanda Nunes. She's coming up again. It's always fun to see her in action. I don't know how she is in such good shape. Like, her abs look like they could completely kill any human being alive, but. I'd love them. <laughs> she she's coming up that she's always a fantastic person to watch so that's kind of what's coming up we'll cover those more as we get closer to them as well all right well that wraps it up for us today any final words on any sports related topics coming get up quentin soon? nelson in the top 100 guys what are you doing <laughs> yeah i'm with you on that one quentin nelson casey hayward big time snubs but that does it for us on high low sports we'll be back with another episode next week um be sure subscribe Follow, share us with the world. 
Don't We're on us. Apple Podcasts and Spotify, the two biggest podcast mediums. Feel free to subscribe to us on those as well, too. Exactly. All right. Well, for the rest, for DJ, I'm Kelsey. We'll see you guys next week.